Hi everyone, this is Amelia Hall, um, getting in touch from Sustainability Abroad for Earth Week. And today we're gonna have a session um, for the next you know, hour or so on houseplant um, maintenance. And so uh, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Jane's got some slides. This is what our horticulture expert, Jane Hall, happens to be my sister. We're doing this from our home. She's got some great plant examples for you. And then for the, for the folks who um, put in information using the form, thank you very much. Um, we have got, Jane has been looking over those, uh, those queries that you have and she'll address those directly. Um, so without further ado, um, welcome to everybody. And um, I'm gonna admit everybody from the waiting room. And uh, yeah, let's get ready for an hour on houseplant maintenance and care. Thanks everybody for your little bit of patience with me. Um, I'm not used to using Zoom. I always work out of the house, so. Um, but anyway, um, so my name is Jane Hall. I'm the presenter for today's talk on houseplant care. Um, a really little bit about me. Um, in 2013, I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Sustainable Horticulture from UMass Amherst. I've worked in a variety of different um, horticulture-based jobs, um, including um, organic CSA farming, uh, greenhouse management, and also um, I worked for a couple of years uh, right in downtown Boston for an interior, a professional interior plant care company. Um, you might know them as cityscapes. You've probably seen their trucks around. So I worked for them for a couple of years and I have uh, extensive background in um, uh, interior plant care. So we're going to get into this today. Let me get going on my slides here. All right. Uh, arrows. Yeah, not used to that. All right, so this is gonna be kind of geared towards a Q and A. Um, so kind of what we're gonna do is like a what's going on with my plants? So we're gonna talk about some common problems you might encounter with your house plants and how you might try to remedy those issues. Um, so I'm gonna give uh, a few examples. Uh, I have a few really common problems in the next slides. Um, so you'll see some uh, image examples, and then I'll kind of explain what's going on. Um, and also, we're going to go over some types of insects that you might be dealing with, um, insects and arachnids. Um, houseplants can be really easy to care for, but they can also be um, kind of tricky to care for, depending on the variety of houseplant. Um, I always tell people this, that uh, try not to beat yourself up. Um, we love our houseplants. They're important in our lives. They kind of become our babies. But um, just remember that for a lot of houseplants, they're coming from uh, a tropical environment, or may, they might be an epiphyte, which you know lives uh, a plant that lives on another plant in a tropical forest, for example, like orchids or epiphytes. Um, so I always tell people try not to beat yourself up uh, when you're having some trouble taking care of your houseplants, because uh, essentially we're taking a plant from an environment that's completely different from the Northeast and trying to recreate some of those environments in our own homes, and that can be really tricky. So um, uh, houseplants can be, some are, some are really easy and some can be really tricky just because of trying to recreate those in you know, tropical environments, which is kind of difficult if you don't have a greenhouse. Um, so most of the slides are going to be visual indicators of underlying issues, um, visual indicators of past problems, um, and things like that. Um, so like I said, we're going to focus on Q&A. So uh, my sister is going to be managing the chat for Zoom. So if you have a question that comes up, um, feel free to just ask it in the chat. And she'll um, kind of stop me wherever and we'll, um, we'll take the question, we'll, we'll go over that. And then I'll go over some of the questions that um, some of you asked beforehand. Um, I did take a look and uh, kind of collected some of my ideas on that. So uh, let's get started. So uh, we're gonna go through this uh, series of slides with really common problems um, that you are gonna see with your houseplants. Um, so the problem one is wilt. It's extremely common, uh, everybody's dealt with it. Uh, so there's a few reasons why you might be experiencing wilt. Uh, your plant might be experiencing wilt. Uh, one is that the plant is not getting enough water. The other one is that the plant is getting too much water. So stay with me here. I'll explain that. Um, or the third option is that a pathogen is infecting the plant systemically, uh, most commonly a bacterial infection. Um, and that can be from a wound on the plant or it can be from um, this, the soil or the potting media itself that that uh, pathogen got in there and got it through um, like a wound on the roots or something like that. Um, so that's called a bacterial wilt. So here's some examples of wilt on the top picture. These are just some stock photos um, that give good examples of you know, the, the photos on for both images. The photo on the bottom image in the center is what the uh, 
peace lily should look like normally. And then um, on the bottom, on the left, it's underwatered. And then on the right, it is overwatered. So they look similar. It's kind of tricky to um, tell the difference sometimes, but there are a few key things that you can um, that you can see. And then on the top photo, there's uh, the left, the very left is a severely wilted, um, what looks like a New Guinea impatience. The middle is like a wilting, like on its way to being pretty wilted, like really dry. Um, so those are the top, the top examples on the left and center are really good examples of that plant is really dried out. Um, and then obviously the, the picture on the right, the right top is um, how that plant should look normally um, when it's watered well and uh, doing fine. So those are some pictures of wilt. I have a plant here that I'll use this really kind of bummer sad plant that we have in our house that needs to be uh, needs to be repotted and it's been struggling a little bit lately. So um, just to give you an example that even though um, I do have a lot of experience in, uh, in caring for houseplants, even somebody like me is going to make a mistake and, you know, maybe let something go to neglect. So a really common houseplant here, it's called spider plant. I'm sure most of you have seen it. Uh, or maybe you have it in your home. They're awesome house plants. They typically grow really well and they're pretty hardy. Um, but uh, there are certain things that can happen with spider plants that um, do involve wilt. So this one is experiencing. So we've had it outdoors the past couple of days. It's been a little bit cold. So um, generally speaking, they don't really like being cold. So that's why it's a little bit wilty right now. Um, so it's going through a little bit of shock. Um, but this plant is also, I'm going to use this plant a few different uh, times in the presentation because it's showing a couple different, uh, it's showing some symptoms of a couple different problems. Um, so one of them is wilt. Um, this plant is extremely pot bound. It really, really needs to be repotted. Um, you can see that um, it's even, can you see that well, Amelia? Uh, if you bring it a little closer, you'll be able to see the roots. You can see that the soil is actually, and the roots are actually, can you see that? Yeah. Pushing up out of the top of the planter. So um, that's one of the ways that you can tell that a, pot, a plant is really severely root bound. Um, it's also coming out with, this is an aerial root um, that's coming out of the side of a stem. Um, and that's another indicator that a plant is getting really, really pot bound. So that's one of the reasons why this plant is struggling. It really needs to be repotted. Um, and then another, um, it's got some dieback going on because I did, we did um, accidentally cold shock it. So it's struggling a little bit. Um, so that's just one example of wilt. It wasn't getting enough water. So it was wilting really easily before. Um, and I'll also use this as an example for a further slide on um, paleness. So that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the examples that we're gonna use. Um, so for wilt, uh, Basically, there's, there's a couple, the, there's a couple uh, key indicators. Um, you should be able to tell if your plant is being underwatered. Um, the first thing you should check is your soil dryness. So if you stick, if you have your house plant and it's wilting, if you stick your fingers, like if you haven't, um, whether you've watered it recently or you haven't, um, if you stick your fingers into the a couple inches down into the soil and it's really dry. Um, then that's a good indicator that your plant just needs to be watered. Um, so give it like a medium drink of water. Um, don't like really flood the heck out of it. Um, and then give it a few hours or a couple days and see if it and see if it comes back. Most, you know, nine times out of 10, it will come back um, if, if underwatering is the issue and you just give it a good drink and um, then check it in a couple of days. It should be doing a bit better. Um, overwatering is very similar, but it's going to be the opposite. If your plant, if you recently um, watered your plant, or if like this, the media in the pot, it, in the pot is um, really really wet, and your plant, um, or it's like it's it's evenly moist, and your plant is just still um, wilting, and it's been wilted for a few days, but that media is wet. That's a good indicator of overwatering. Um, if that plant's not responding to being wet, um, it probably means that it is too wet and it's, it's experiencing, uh, probably experiencing root rot, which is a really common problem. Um, so occasionally, like if you have a, if it's the middle of winter, or it's been really cloudy for a while, or if it's particularly cold in your home and you have a plant that you're kind of watering like you normally would, um, but it's, the plant isn't 
either photosynthesizing fast enough to deal with that water or it's too too chilly to deal with that water um, then you could be experiencing some overwatering there so uh, so watch out for just watch out for that and just follow some some watering recommendations for for each plant that you get uh, the next problem is leaf tip burns this is a really common one um, again we're experiencing that with our um a little bit with our spider plant but that's a little bit more of like a necrosis so a uh, leaf tip burn can be caused by a few different things um, one again being the plant is too dry the other one is the plant is being over fertilized so that would be a nutrient burn or a fertilizer burn um, some people call that and then the other the other one which is a little bit um, more difficult to determine is if um, if it has a certain nutrient deficiencies will cause um, particular yellowing pattern patterns in the leaves. Um, so that's one that I would go through like an extension, like a, uh, for example, like UMass extension um, and talk to an, ex uh, an extension advisor um, through like a university and, you know, show them some pictures um, or like look it up in, um, you know, a good manual for plant care um, and see what some of those deficiencies look like because they're all a little bit different and they tend to be pretty pretty specific. Um, so that's that's some of the reasons for leaf tip burn. I actually did find um, some leaf tip burn on our spider plant and I hope you'll be able to see this but this this plant and this leaf in particular is this this end tip part is really dry. Uh, this plant was really struggling to get enough water uh, because it's so pot bound and we couldn't water it enough so um, that's a little bit of an example of leaf tip burn. I've got some pictures, really classic tip burn um, on this, uh, in this picture. It's a, it's a corn plant, which is a tropical plant. So that's kind of what it looks like. It's some yellowing and drying of the tips of the leaves. Um, so if your plant, if you're, if you're, you know, kind of watering, regularly and your plant's happy with its amount of water and it's still getting leaf tip burn that's a good indicator that um, it might be getting over fertilized so if you're if you're fertilizing a plant um, for example with like a liquid fertilizer like every time you water um, it's possible that you're just that it needs a break from the fertilizer um, so you can kind of remedy that by just backing off on fertilizing it for a few weeks and just um, and you can also, for a lot of plants, you can just cut those tips off or remove those leaves um, and just see how the plant responds after that um, to a little bit less fertilizer. Um, on the other hand, if your plant's really dry, try giving it um, a little bit more water, watering a little bit more frequently um, for a few weeks, cut off those dry tips or remove those leaves and see how it responds. And if its leaves are um, healthy and normal and you're not getting tip burn, then that could be a solution for you there. So problem three, which kind of relates to that is yellowing and or paleness. So yellowing is predominantly caused by nutrient deficiency or the plant is drying out. Um, so I kind of alluded to this before with leaf yellowing um, or a tip burn or something like that. Um, yeah, it's the most common deficiency is nitrogen, uh, but yellowing in certain patterns can be caused by other nutrient deficiencies such as magnesium. So I kind of referenced that before where um, you could reach out to an extension agent or look in a, um, a horticulture manual for some of those different uh, patterns for nutrient deficiencies and yellowing and leaves. Um, paleness is caused by nutrient deficiency and low light levels. Um, and it can also be caused by a pet pest infestation such as spider mites um, because they're, those uh, pests are physically um, damaging those leaves by sucking out the chlorophyll. So, um, so that's why it's gonna develop some paleness. Um, this plant was actually, it's looking a little bit more green now, um, but this plant was actually really, really pale before we put it outside. And part of that, um, spider plants classically get really pale from being pot bound. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons they're stressed out. Um, so sometimes if your plant is stressed out and pot bound, um, it'll become a little bit more pale, but it could also be an indicator of spider mites in particular. Um, so some examples of yellowing um, on these three really classic house plants. So there's a, a pothos, a dracaena, and a money plant. Um, this is some of the what that yellowing might look like. 
um, for, for yellowing leaves like this, um, generally speaking, if you're trying to kind of clean up the look of your plant, which is what I did a lot of when I did interior plant care, um, you can just pick for a lot of plants, you can just pick those leaves off and try to remedy the problem so you're not dealing with too much yellowing. Um, and this is what some pictures of paleness looks like. So the upper left-hand corner is uh, bamboo that's getting pale. Um, in that case, uh, bamboo is often grown in water and, and like uh, rocks. So neither one of those has a whole lot of nutrients to it. So one thing I've done for um, to kind of remedy that nutrient deficiency paleness in bamboo or anything that's grown in water is to just add a little bit of liquid fertilizer, the dilute liquid fertilizer to the water, and that should help it. Because um, other than, um, besides that, it's really not getting a whole lot of nutrients. Um, and then the lower right-hand corner, that's the spider plant that's getting pale. Um, in this case, it also looks pot bound. It's just getting too big for its pot, like the one we have here on the table that I've shown you a couple times. Um, so that's kind of what paleness would look like. It's just not as deep green as you would expect that plant to be. So that's what paleness really refers to. Um, problem four, which is gonna be a bunch of different slides because I have a slide for what each pest looks like is insect pests. So insects um, and arachnid pests can wreak havoc on your houseplants. Some of the most common houseplant pests are fungus gnats, spider mites, mealybugs, scale, and thrips. Um, so fungus gnats can really infect anything. Um, you might see them if you notice like little tiny flies um, that look kind of like mosquitoes, but they're really small, small flying around your home, probably have a fungus gnat problem. It's really, really, really common, um, especially if you've just bought plants from a garden center and you bring them in your home and then those plants had um, fungus gnats. So they're super common. Um, and the only thing that, so the, the flying insect, the adult, uh, form of fungus gnats is not, there can be a little bit annoying um, to have in your home, but they, they, that, the adult form actually doesn't affect the plants. It's the larval stage that affects the plants. They can eat your plant roots. Um, so if you have them flying around in your home, you might have the larvae in your plants. Um, so you can do uh, something to kind of remedy those is, um, you can buy a treatment that will kill those larvae that you can actually um, water the plant with, so. And then, uh, so I'm gonna go through the next few slides and kind of describe each pest. Okay, we did have another, we did have a question mm -hmm. in the chat specific from a few minutes ago, specific yeah. to fungus gnats, which was- um, Perfect. Uh, lots of, okay, great. So um, uh, Amber asks, um, yeah, I wonder if you have any tips for mitigating fungus gnats. Seems to be a lot of conflicting information online in terms of remedies that work or don't work. Um, I've set out sticky traps, vinegar traps, sprayed hydrogen peroxide mixtures, but still struggling to keep gnats at bay. I'm a bit nervous to spray any insecticides or oils directly on the plants. I want to be mindful of pet safe solutions, any experience or recommendations. So um, we had to deal with fungus gnats all the time, um, especially when I worked in interior plant care. And um, because we, that was really important to remedy them there because there are people around and the plants are in offices and fungus gnats are really obnoxious to have just flying around because they'll get in your face. Um, and so the sticky traps is a big one that we used. Um, the reason that sticky traps, so they're, they're usually pretty, they're pretty effective in at least getting your adult population down, which is gonna reduce the amount of larvae that you have in your plants. Um, so the larvae are what are, like I said before, what's actually gonna damage your plant because they will eat your plant roots. Um, so the sticky traps definitely help and they're like a non-chemical way to to mitigate the adult population and get that down so that you're at least not having so much reproduction going on. Um, so that's, I always recommend that um, just as, you know, like an added or initial um, way of trapping those pests and killing them, but also of seeing like how much of a problem you have. So if you put a sticky trap in um, and then, you know, a couple of days later, it's like filled with fungus gnats, then you really have a bigger problem that you have to deal with. Um, so the one, the, the thing that we use, um, and I actually, I don't remember the product name, but you can look them up online. Um, for fungus gnats, you wouldn't, you wouldn't spray anything directly on the plant. What you would use because that larval stage is your problem, which is going to eat your plant roots, is you're going to use a soil drench. So um, you can, 
I just can't remember the name because I worked at Seascapes a few years ago. I can't for the life of, me, life of me remember the name of the soil drench that we did use. Um, so, oh no, now I remember it. I had to like rack my brain for a minute. So what we used, so at Cityscapes, it was important that we, uh, that we didn't use um, more chemicals really than we needed. So what we did use there to deal with fungus gnats was actually a biological control. And we bought in um, fungus gnat nematodes. Uh, nematodes are a soil organism. Um, and they're actually a, an organism that, um, is pervasive through humans and animals and soils and plants and there are uh, a ton of different species of them so um, a lot of them are for predatory nematodes which is what we used they it was uh we would get the nematodes and you can actually buy them um they have to be refrigerated but you can buy them in and they're a natural biological control so what we would do is we would um, take the packets of nematodes you take like a tea, I think what we used was, it was like a teaspoon per um, gallon or a teaspoon per, per like two gallon um, watering can. And then you put them, they're like, it's like a white kind of chunky powder that you get. Cause they're, it's like a million like tiny microscopic live animals that you're actually using. Um, so you put that in your watering bucket and then uh, mix it around quite a bit so that it, the, the water is like kind of milking it evenly distributed and that's what you're going to water your plant with. Um, it's natural, it's non-chemical. And so there, every bucket of water, there's like 2 million of these uh, microscopic nematodes that are going to prey on those uh, fungus gnat larvae and kill them. So that's actually, that's the method that we use for cityscapes. Um, it's really, really effective. Um, so I, my recommendation would be to put the sticky traps in like you're doing, see what kind of a population that you're dealing with, and then um, check out those nematodes. Um, so that would be, that's a really good method. It worked really, really well at Cityscapes. Any other questions? Uh, we do have another question. This is taking it back a little bit okay. from the pests, um, but Kai asks, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with a plant, how long should you wait after you try something before trying something else if, if your initial method doesn't help right away. And then they add, I have a plant that's dying and I'm concerned that I'm overwatering it, but the care instructions say to water fairly frequently. So I'm worried I'll stress it more by reducing water if that's not the problem. Um, yeah, that's kind of a tricky one. Um, when you have a dying plant, you're really like trying to scramble to figure it out. Um, I usually, if, I, if I'm trying to figure out a problem with my plant, um, I'll usually try something for like a week or two and I'll see how the plant responds. Uh, generally plants, plants can respond pretty quickly to any like a, a form of treatment um, or if they're being like mistreated, uh, whether like, so if you're accidentally overwatering it, um, you might see some of that, some of those effects like pretty quickly. Um, so I usually, yeah, I'll go, I'll try, I'll try something for like one to two weeks and see how the plant responds. Um, what kind of a plant is it? I might be able to get a little more specific if they know what kind of a plant it is. I will, uh, it's a bird's nest fern. Okay. Ferns are tricky. Um, I kind of alluded to this before, like way at the beginning when we're trying to recreate environments for our plants that are completely like in our homes, um, when we're taking that plant from like a really specific environment. So plants really like kind of moist, humid conditions. They don't like to get really cold. Um, and, uh, but they're really easy to kill. So um, I've killed ferns. I have friends who've killed ferns. Um, so like I said before, don't, try not to beat yourself up. Um, the thing with ferns is there's a really fine line between them being evenly moist and them being either too dry or too wet. Um, one thing I would try for your fern is to try to keep it in a more humid part of your home. And then, but try, when you do that, back off the watering like a little bit. So I don't know how frequently you're watering it. Um, and it, they like to be evenly moist. But my recommendation is to just kind of, every time you're checking it out, 
um, especially if you move it to like a moist part of your home, for example, like a bathroom window, something like that, um, or like a bathroom, a bathroom area that has like at least a little bit of light around it. Um, anyway, so just just when you're kind of checking it out, put a finger like in the top of the soil and every couple of days and just see like how wet it is. If, if you put your finger in that, in the media, the soil media, and it's still like pretty wet, just leave it alone. Um, just wait to water it because they do like to be evenly moist. But like I said, it's really, they have really fine, delicate roots um, that are pretty susceptible to, to rot. Um, so I would, I would just try to monitor your watering. And if it's, if it's, if the media is wet, um, try to give it another day or two before you check it out. Um, so try that. But again, ferns can be a little bit tricky. They They're do really, that. The leaves are turning brown and crinkly. The leaves are turning brown and crinkly. Could be, could be drying out, could be root rot. It's tough to tell with the fern because that's how ferns will respond is they'll, their leaves will dry up for like kind of for anything that they're upset with, um, their leaves will kind of dry up. So I would try backing, I, initially I would try backing off the watering a little bit. Um, and then if that doesn't do anything, um, yeah, monitor the watering and then you could try to give it like, and if that doesn't do anything, try to give it a little bit of fertilizer, um, move it to a different location. Um, but yeah, just give it give it a little bit of time between treatments, like a, a week or two, like maybe even two weeks. Try something for two weeks, and then uh, if that doesn't do it, then move on to something else. Um, and if your fern dies, the really it can be really tricky to take care of because it's so difficult it, outside of like uh, a really moist steamy bathroom that has a skylight in it, it can be like kind of tricky to recreate those environments that they actually want to be in. Um, so try not to beat yourself up, but give it, give those remedies a shot. Thank you. And then uh, Trish also um, points out that uh, moisture meters can be a really good way to prevent overwatering. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good suggestion. Um, I used, yeah. Moisture meters are good. Um, also, using a potting media that is like a moisture control potting media can really help you help you keep that um, media and keep those roots like evenly moist, um, so that you're not worrying about the frequency of your watering because it's like drying out too quickly. So repotting with a media like that can help as well as long as like um, soil uh, and media moisture. Uh, measuring devices. So, anything else? No questions. Okay. Right now. All right. Um, so I'm gonna keep um, keep the questions coming. Those are really good questions, guys. So I'm gonna keep moving along. So those are fungus gnats, kind of explained um, in the last question that one of the last questions we had about um, you know how they're gonna affect your plant and then how to treat those. Um, so the next one is spider mites. Spider mites are super super common. Um, and they can be, um, their spider mites are an arachnid. They're related to um, like ticks and spiders. Um, so not actually an insect, but they are an arachnid, but they're related. Um, spider mite infestations can get out of control really, really quickly. So some of the, some of the telltale signs of a spider mite infestations are in the top picture, you're gonna see that webbing. Um, so kind of similarly to spiders, they, they do create a webbing um, environment to uh, reproduce in and uh, call their home on the plant. So they do, so if you notice some kind of spidery like webbing, but it's not spiders um, and a lot of like little specks all over your plant, um, that's telltale indicator of a spider mite infection. Um, another telltale indicator is what's called stippling. So you can kind of see it in the top picture, but it's like little, it's almost like somebody poked your plant leaf with a pin a bunch of times and it might and there's some yellowing there as well or paleness like I referenced before um, because those insects are are physically um, uh, feeding on that plant and they're feeding on um, they're taking some of the, the chlorophyll out of that plant in feeding on it so um, the paleness 
So uh, spider mites like webbing, paleness, and then like a million little tiny specks all over it is uh, most likely to be spider mites. It happens really commonly in uh, hot, dry conditions. So if your plant is like a Dracaena um, or something like that, and it likes to be uh, pretty warm and uh, the upper part of the plant is pretty far away from the lower part of the plant. Um, so your upper part of your plant might be really dry, like around the leaves, um, even though it's like evenly moist. Um, so that's really common for Dracaenas, corn plants, things like that. Um, spider plants, they, they definitely are susceptible to spider mites. Uh, best way to treat spider mites, I would say, is like a neem oil spray um, or an insecticidal soap. Um, neem oil is very similar to insecticidal soap. Um, so this is, this is a neem oil that you might buy in your garden center. Um, this one, the brand is Bonide. Um, so this is really common that you could find. So it's a fungicide, miticide, and insecticide. So in this case, we're looking for the miticide property of that. Um, so you're going to use a spray. Uh, the way that we would do it at Cityscapes is we would basically, um, so the plant that's affected, you're going to spray this and drench the leaves. So you're going to spray over the entire plant. And then um, spider mites, the reason why they pop up in really hot, dry is they hate moisture. They do not like moisture. Um, so the moisture will mess with them and the neem oil um, will kill them. So that's a really good way to deal with spider mites. Um, spider mite infestations can be really um, obnoxious and they can take over a plant really, really quickly because re their reproductive cycle is extremely short. Um, so you can have a problem on your hands, but using a spray and just drenching that entire plant. And then um, another thing I use is you could use paper towels and then actually physically like wiping, um, wiping the plant leaves. So you're gonna be um, really in getting, get into like all the um, crevices between the leaves and the stems um, with that spray and getting in there and like physically trying to remove and wipe those leaves and wipe those nests out. Um, so that's usually pretty effective. And then, so once I've like sprayed it and then wiped the whole plant, I usually give it another quick spray. Um, that way, uh, even if you did miss some, it's gonna kill them. The spray is gonna kill those spider mites. And then also having that um, film of the neem oil spray on there or the insecticidal soap spray is going to deter a further infection. So that's what I usually do for spider mites. So it seems a little, it can, be see, it can seem daunting and kind of gross to deal with, but um, that spray is actually really effective for them. All right, we're gonna move on to mealybugs. So I actually have um, one of the pictures here is from a plant that I have sitting right next to me. So I'll show you that as well. Um, I actually discovered a couple of days ago that it has a mealybug infestation. Um, so mealybugs are this kind of white louse looking um, insect. Uh, they're related to scales. Um, and I'll show you in one of the next slides. So mealybugs are kind of annoying to deal with, but they're, they can really get into, the reason why they're annoying is they get into all the crevices of your plants. So if you have a mealybug infestation, their favorite place to go is like between all the leaves and in like kind of crevicey um, uh, tight spaces. So that's why they can be pretty difficult to deal with. Again, they also have, they have many different stages of um, larvae, which are called instars in the insect world. Um, so they can have like multiple generations all over a plant. So they can be kind of tricky <clears throat> to deal with. So you're not just dealing with adults, but you're dealing with larvae as well, which you know, kind of can be tricky and they'll be, they'll really kind of get all over your plants. So the plant that actually is in the picture um, is this one here. So this is, um, this plant is a calanche. It's also called a uh, mother of millions. So this is, um, one of these, they're kind of a succulent type plant. Um, mealybugs also go for a little bit uh, a drier of a plant. So they tend to, to show up on um, things like succulents or succulent type plants like this. And um, they can show up on cacti, but they also can show, I mean, they can show up on anything, but this is one of the really common uh, types of plants is succulents that they'll show up on because it's a bit drier. Um, generally, because you're not watering them all the time. So I'll try to get the camera a little bit closer up on this um, to see. I don't know if you can see that at all, Amelia. 
I'm not sure how. Getting like, closer to some can here in a better. Like that. There you go. There we yeah, go. There so this is. So you can see this mealy bug infestation. Um, and again, like, they just look like cotton balls. They look like you wiped a cotton ball over it. Um, they don't move very quickly. Um, they kind of stick in one place, but they definitely tend to get. They can really get in the, in the crevices of the plant. Um, I'll show you that. Um, so it's this, this actually, this entire plant is infested. Um, and they, it's really common to get them in and around new growth on the plant as well. So this is on the stem and like an old, some older growth, but I'll show you kind of what it looks like. Yeah. It's like killing this new growth and I'll show, I'll get this kind of closer up into some new growth here. Can you see that, Amelia? Yep. Oh, yeah, All right, so you can see that it's kind of like a white dusting almost. Um, and these are larval stages. Um, so they're, the adults are kind of for down further on the stem. Um, and then a lot of these very tiny kind of white powdery looking larval stages are around the new growth and they're feeding on that. Um, so that's uh, definitely stunting and killing this plant. Um, I'm gonna try to treat it later today. I don't really know if I'm gonna have a whole lot of luck, but. Um, another, so the treatment that we would use for mealybugs would be the neem oil or insecticidal soap again. In this instance, um, very similar to spider mites, you're really going to want to um, get into all the crevices. Like you're going to want to drench the plant. You're going to want to get that neem oil um, spray into every single crevice of the plant you can, um, especially focusing on that new growth. So you can try to kill back um, some of those larval stages um, and kill some of those um, you know, second, third, fourth generation stages back, um, as well as the adults. Um, another thing that's important in this case, so get, get that spray really into every crevice that you possibly can, focusing on new growth. Um, and then, so because mealybugs don't move very quickly, um, uh, you can physically remove them pretty easily. Um, so some of the, the big ones on the side here, you can get in there with a paper towel and like physically remove those. Um, this infestation is going to be really tricky to deal with. I already know that. <laughs> um, we noticed it a little too, too late, um, uh, which, you know, which happens and, and with, with insects reproduce really quickly. So it's really easy to go from like a few insects to um, like a thousand. Um, so something like this, we'll try to treat it with the insecticidal soap. I'll try to remove as much of those, much of those adults as I can um and then we'll just and the thing that i do want to stress for some of those drenches that are um like the neem oil sprays um where you're going to drench the upper part of the plant um those can be like repeated um so like if it, you do it one week and then you try to remove as much as you can and then you still notice some some insects you can repeat it you know a week or two later and just try to keep treating that plant until you you've killed off all the generations or as many as you can. So um, that's something just that I wanna stress is like for foliage treatments, you can try retreating multiple times um, to try to kill off all those generations of insects. We do, we do have a question from the chat. Mm -hmm. Maria asks, does neem oil work better than insecticidal soap? Um, not necessarily. Um, I think that they work similarly. Um, in that they're a lot of what they're doing is suffocating. Um, they're suffocating those uh, insects. So uh, they work really, really similarly. Um, so you could try insecticidal. Yeah, I mean, honestly, they, they kind of, you could try either one. Um, neem oil does describe that it's fungicidal. Um, as well as insecticidal. So that's like an additional benefit for neem oil. Um, so especially, you know, if you're gonna, if you're trying to treat like a uh, foliage um, fungus, so you can use it for that as well. So I guess what I was saying is neem oil is a little bit more multi-purpose, whereas insecticidal soap is more targeted towards insects. Um, but in the case of using either one, for the treatment of insects, I think you could go one or the other. They both work really well. Okay.
So um, the next one I'm going to move on to is scale. So scale is um, a little bit less common and a little bit less, depending on your infestation, it's a little bit less destructive than some of the previous um, insects and arachnids that I've referenced before in the previous slides. Um, so scale is really, really common to find on um, tropical plants. Um, so if you have like big, I'll use the example of like a majesty palm, which is like a, those kind of, like if you might go into like a hotel lobby or something like that, and you see these like big frondy um, palms, that's a majesty palm. Um, so those are, so that's a tropical plant. Um, so scale is very common on tropical plants. So if you go to your garden center and you're like, man, I really wanna put a bunch of tropical house plants in my home. Um, this could be something that you're looking out for and that you might have an issue with later on. Um, just because you're buying it new from a garden center does not mean it's going to have, does not mean it's not going to have pests on it. So definitely be looking out for pests uh, when you're purchasing a plant and uh, be wary that um, you might have to deal with a problem later on. Um, so just check over your plants. So this is good for preparation if you're planning to buy house plants. Um, so skills related to mealybug. Um, in this case, most of what you're going to deal with is called armored scale, which is the two pictures. Um, so the adult form of this type of scale actually essentially like cements itself to a part of that plant and then they are immobile for their adult life and then they just continuously feed on that plant. So they're really slow feeders um, and they're slow to infest a plant. Um, but they can be really hard to get rid of simply because they actually like cemented themselves to that plant. So the easiest way for to deal with scale um, would be a systemic insecticide. So that's something again, similarly to what you're going to use as a soil drench. Um, so if you need to look it up, if you need to do a treatment like that um, for a pest like this that is like that has glued itself, to your plant um, leaves or stems or anywhere on your plant, the easiest way is gonna be using a systemic insecticide where you're gonna add that insecticide to a gallon of water and then drench your soil. And the plant will take that up and it will kill the insects that are attached to that plant. So that's something you would use for scale. Um, you can use insecticidal soap as well. Um, if you don't wanna use uh, systemic soil drench, it's totally fine. Um, that's kind of something to be used in like an extreme case. You can use insecticidal soap and neem oil for these as well. It's just a little bit more tricky because um, they have attached themselves to that plant. So like the um, accessing, you know, accessing like a fleshy part of that uh, insect is a little bit harder to like with armored scale. Um, so the next one is thrips. Thrips are super, super, super common and they're really annoying to deal with. Um, they're really common in greenhouse production uh, issues for interior and exterior house plant, uh, plants. Um, so this is kind of, they're extremely small. They can be white or black. They kind of look like in the picture, they're the little black specks that you see there. Um, and then you can see on the larger leaf on the left side, um, there's a little bit of, so that's stippling is those kind of, um, not the larger black dots, but the tinier, more clustered um, little specks. Um, that's stippling and that's insect feeding damage. Um, stippling is really, really common um, indicator that you have thrips. Um, and then on the leaf that's on the right-hand side is like a severely damaged leaf um, that's actually puckering. Um, so that's from the, the leaf being overfed on by thrips and um, severely damaged. So you can see that. Um, thrips can be tricky to treat. Uh, you can use leaf sprays for them and just repeat leaf sprays uh, because they reproduce really quickly and uh, thrips are really, really small. So I recommend doing like a repeat um, sprays of like neem oil or insecticidal soap or something like that. Um, to treat those. All right, so uh, I've referenced a few of these before, but there's some products for treating houseplant pests, which is the neem oil spray that we talked about like this that you get at your garden center, insecticidal soap, diatomaceous earth powder, 
and sticky traps. So sticky traps specifically to, you can use sticky traps for monitoring. Um, so those are those yellow, um, they come in packs of, they're essentially like a, a yellow plastic card usually. And uh, sometimes they have a grid pattern on them um, for doing like tracking. And uh, so they're extremely sticky. So if you ever get those and you have to use them, just be aware that like they will get uh, sticky stuff all over your fingers if you're not careful and it's really hard to get off. Um, so the sticky traps are good for monitoring, but they're also good for trapping, um, at least at least a little bit of trapping for fungus gnats and thrips. Um, so you can put those in your plant. If you think you might have a pest problem, um, then you can put a sticky trap in your plant and then look at it a few days later and see what's on there um, and kind of try to identify your problem from there. Um, it's really common to be used in greenhouse production uh, is using sticky traps for pest monitoring. Um, so those are some of the treatments that you would find. Um, I forgot to add in the soil drench, um, either a systemic insecticide soil drench uh, for some of those uh, soil like above ground um, pests like scale, and then also the um, predatory nematodes that I talked about for um, trying to deal with uh, a fungus gnat larvae problem. So I forgot to add those in here, um, but we probably have them in the chat. So definitely check that out. All right, so these are the photo URLs, just referencing those. And then, um, so this kind of brings me to the, the question and answer um, portion of the presentation. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for coming to the talk. And then I hope it helps you in providing better care for your houseplants. Um, thanks for asking questions so far. Uh, we had a few questions um, that some of you asked before the presentation today, which I don't know if I can access those. Uh, yeah, I can share. I might have them. And then while so we're I'm gonna try to answer some of those questions. Yeah, while I'm getting at that, um, someone had a question about fertilizing, a question from the chat on fertilizing indoor plants. Okay, so um, fertilizing indoor plants, the thing to think about is number one, um, what type of a plant is it? Uh, look up a little bit of research on e each of those house plants that you have um, initially and just see um, what types of fertilizing requirements they might involve um, and like what they might need specifically, whether they need um, or nitrogen or phosphorus or magnesium or something like that. Um, as a general rule, houseplants are going to grow more slowly than um, outdoor plants. So your fertilizing is going to be uh, less frequent and um, or at like a lower uh, concentration. So you're going to dilute those, you're going to dilute that um, fertilizer a little bit more, um, especially you can do consistent fertilizing. So consistent like fertilizing would be uh, fertilizing every time you water in which you would really, really want to dilute that fertilizer so that you're not over fertilizing those plants. Cause for interior plants, like I said, they're going to, they're going to typically, they're going to grow a little bit more slowly than outdoor plants that are in a full sun environment. Um, so you can do that kind of dilute consistent watering or uh, what we did when I worked at Cityscapes is we did um, uh, fertilizing like, I did fertilizing there for most plants, like, I don't know, every six weeks, once a month. Um, so then you can use a less dilute uh, one-time fertilizing, you know, every so often, every few weeks or every couple months. Um, so my best recommendations to avoid uh, fertilizer barn is to just check and see what that plant needs. Some plants really don't need a whole lot of fertilizer at all. Some plants need a bit more um, because they're bigger or they're a deeper green or something like that. Um, and then if you have a plant that's in a low light environment, they're going to use less water and less fertilizer because they are not um, relying as heavily on photosynthesizing as much. So those are things to keep in mind for fertilizing those plants. Um, I hope that answered your question. If you need specifics, definitely ask in the chat. So we had a few questions before. So the first question is, um, 
I've been growing uh, tree seedlings for the last year and a half and hopefully uh, to cultivate bonsai trees about a year ago I transferred them from soil to volcanic rock all three have continued to grow but at different rates. The Celderon gets a lot of sun during the morning hours and into the early afternoon. I water once or twice weekly depending on how dry the substrates look. Um, any advice for their care is much appreciated. So um, personally I don't have a ton of experience growing bonsais but um, the main point that I that I will get at here is that um, so you transfer them to soil or soilless media like potting mix to volcanic rock. So um, volcanic rock may be great with providing some micronutrients and minerals, um, but it is going to be deficient in um, like uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, generally speaking, especially nitrogen, um, because that volcanic rock doesn't really have a whole lot of um, uh, genetic, uh, organic material. There's not, there's really none of that there. So uh, my recommendation would be uh, to fertilize a little bit. Um, I don't know what, it depends on if, if your bonsais, I'm assuming they're like a, like a juniper, or like an evergreen or something like that. Um, and those, those like tend to like a little bit more of an acidic fertilizer. Um, they're bonsai, so they're not gonna need a lot of fertilizer because you don't want them to grow like quickly. Um, so, but my, that would be my recommendation would be to, um, you know, maybe once a month or once every couple of months, just give them some fertilizer just to make sure that they actually have some nutrients to keep, um, you know, growing at like a slower rate, but to help keep them healthy. So that would be my recommendation. Um, besides that, if they're, um, and that, like, if you, if you notice them growing at different rates, I don't know if they're the same type of plant. Um, if there are different types of plants that might explain why they're growing at different rates. Um, but it might also, the other thing that might explain that is that they do need a little bit of fertilizer. So if you have one that's growing like really, really slowly, you could try to give it a little bit of a push um, with a little bit more fertilizer um, initially and then see how they respond. Uh, that would be my best recommendation is fertilize them and see how they respond to that um, uh, before you kind of do something else to, to mitigate and just look at, see how they do after that. Um, the next question is, can you go over how to propagate something like a philodendron, philodendron, excuse me. I've always been worried I would just accidentally kill it. So yeah, definitely. I've done uh, quite a bit of uh, propagation in my experience so far. So um, a philodendron, there's a few different types of philodendrons. There's a philodendron um, that's like a larger plant um, that has kind of long stalks and big leaves. Um, there's also like a vining type of philodendron. Um, both of them can be propagated vegetatively. So if you have a large philodendron that has a lot of roots and uh, a lot of stalks, um, I would take a look at the bottom of that plant and see if you have, um, so look at the bottom of a stalk of it um, you might find like a kind of like a crusty dried out stem looking area that's right above the soil um, and see if you have any uh, what's called aerial roots. I actually showed some aerial roots on the spider plant um, and they're literally like kind of fat um, roots that have uh, that are look a little bit dried out that are coming from um, the side of the stem like close to the soil line. So if you have that um, one thing that you can do is uh, if you have those aerial roots on a section of the plant, you can actually cut out that section of plant as long as it has aerial roots and it has um, like, you know, a, a couple uh, leaf stalks or something like that. And then you can repot that. Um, so you can try propagating that way. Um, if your plant is like massive and you really need to deal with it, you can do that, but you can split it right down the middle. So you can take the whole thing out of the pot and you can just separate it. Um, you can use, if the roots, if it's really like root bound or pot bound or something like that, um, you can use a knife and you can cut it right down the middle and you can repot those sections. Um, so that's one thing you can do for like a huge philodendron. Um, if you have a vining type of philodendron, they also create those aerial roots, but they're a little bit harder to see. Um, they'll happen at uh, like a, a leaf node, um, uh, or like a node along the stem, which a node is a growth point you'll often find leaves uh, growing in and around out of that growth point. 
Um, so what you can do is you can actually, you can propagate them by, um, like if you have the end of a vine, let's say you had um, a vining plant and you had a six inches hanging down, you can actually cut um, above one of those nodes and cut that section off. Um, take a couple of the bottom leaves off of it so that you kind of have a clean section of stem and then the rest of the end of the plant. Um, and you can put that in some water and it will root in the water. Um, and you can let it root for a little while until it's got a good bunch of roots and then you can repot that section of plant. Um, so those are two ways that you can uh, propagate philodendron. Um, that works really well for a lot of different types of plants. Um, so either um, cutting off chunks of the plants and repotting them, or you can propagate them in water. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do that that doesn't involve like buying rooting hormone or anything like that. So. The next question is, um, I have a few varieties of orchid cactus and while they seem happy, I hear mixed things about whether to keep the soil most moist but well drained or on the drier side. Um, I water now when the top inch or so of soil is dry. Is that the right way to go about it? Um, thank you. Um, good question. I think you're going about it the right way. Uh, that's a good rule of thumb for a lot of plants besides succulents because they're in their, in their own category of uh, soil dryness. Um, so generally speaking, I also water a lot of things when the top inch or so the soil is dry. Um, I did do a little, I looked into those plants a little bit because I wasn't super familiar with them, but they are um, epiphytes, which means they're kind of similar to orchids. So they like to be um, moist, but well-drained, but a little bit on the drier side because it, they, they'll grow in kind of like a, a tropical environment, like on like a mossy area, like on a tree. Um, so that environment is kind of tricky to recreate, which is why like orchids can be uh, tricky to care for unless you get them in the right spot. Um, and like plants like the ones that you have can be a little bit tricky to care for unless you have them in the right spot with the right amount of water. Um, I think you're going about it the right way. Um, so I would keep doing what you're doing, especially if they seem happy. Um, that's a good indicator that you're doing the right thing. So um, keep doing what you're doing. That sounds good. The next question is, uh, I have a Meyer lemon tree that's overrun with mealybugs. I keep picking them off, but there's anything else I could do. I referenced this uh, earlier. Um, just try to keep using that neem oil spray or an insecticidal soap. Um, do drench, just drench, drench, drench the upper part of that plant and also the stock because mealybugs might be on uh, might be on the trunk of that tree as well and you just can't see them because they're really small like early larval stages. Um, so drench the upper part of that plant with the neem oil or insecticidal soap spray and um, try to use a paper towel to kind of wipe those off. Get really in between like wipe every leaf if you can like just spend like an hour or something depending on how big it is. Um, really spend some time drenching the whole thing and trying to wipe those things off and then um, seeing how it responds after a week or two and see if you still have that infestation and then um, keep respraying and retreating would be my, my, uh, my best advice because mealybugs can be tricky to get rid of because they get in all those little crevices and like little areas that you might not necessarily be seeing. Um, so that's my recommendation for that. Keep trying. You can, you can get rid of a mealybug problem in certain, in certain scenarios. I've done it before. It's just a little tricky and you have to be patient. Do you have one? I think that was one of the last ones on there. Okay. We do have one last question sure. from Jay Way, which is, uh, is the nematode treatment a one-time treatment for fungus gnats or something that needs to be repeated? Um, typically, it is, it is so effective that that nematode treatment can be a one-shot deal. Um, the amount of nematodes, so if you, you know, if you do it the way that we did at Cityscapes where you buy in those nematodes, um, they also, they have to be kept in the fridge, just so you know, they are live animals, they need to be kept in the fridge. Um, they do stay for a little while if you keep them in the fridge. Um, but the, the amount of nematodes, especially if it's like um, a smaller plant, the amount of nematodes that you're putting in there is in the millions. So um, generally speaking, for the amount of uh, under soil pests that you're dealing with, like fungus gnat larvae, 
um, that will be a one, a one treatment thing will be really, really effective. Um, but if you, and like, let, let like a month go by after that treatment to see how your plant is responding. And then like use those, if it's fungi gnats, fungus gnats you're dealing with, use those sticky traps and keep monitoring during that period of time. And like use one sticky trap a week for that month or so that you have after your treatment. And just like keep monitoring and seeing like if, if your adult population is going down, it means your treatment is, is effective. So keep monitoring for a month. And if you're still having a fungus snap problem after a month, um, you can do a retreatment and that's not going to hurt your plant or anything like that. All right, awesome. so everyone's been saying thank you. So we're just past the top of the hour. Thanks for everyone who stayed with us uh, for this session. We hope that you all had your questions answered. Um, and thanks again. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thanks, guys. Happy, happy Earth Day. <laughs>